I start every day with a cup of coffee, the morning paper, the good word of the day, and the daily Wordle. What's Wordle, you ask? It's a five-letter word puzzle that gives you five chances to guess the word of the day. It's fun, and it stimulates my brain. I know it's important to exercise both body and mind. There is one more thing I like about a puzzle like Wordle. It's a parable about life, because life is a puzzle. It's not a trivial pursuit to find the words that help us make sense of our world. Consider Martin Luther, a reformer of the church. 500 years ago, this obscure German monk was puzzled by his relationship with God. What does God want? What does God expect from us? How does God relate to us? Is there a word that solves that puzzle? The common answer was, yes, there is. God helps those who help themselves. God expects you to be a good person, to do the right thing. The word that Luther learned was deeds. Do good deeds to get on God's good side. The problem is that the Bible doesn't say that and it doesn't solve the problem. Good deeds are good because they're good. But that's not the answer to the puzzle. In fact, the more Luther tried to please God, the worse he felt inside. He was aware of the problem, but not the answer. He felt like a sinner in the hands of an irate God. As a monk, Luther said, I led an irreproachable life. Nevertheless, I felt that I was a sinner before God. My conscience was restless, and I couldn't depend on God being satisfied by my deeds. Not only did I not love, I actually hated the righteous God who punishes sinners. Luther feared, what if he died like this? What if he went to his grave under God's judgment? So Luther searched the scriptures for an answer. The answer must be there in God's word. Luther wrote, a furious battle raged within my puzzled conscience. But meanwhile, I was knocking at the door of this particular Pauline passage. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is faith from first to last, as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Or as Paul will later say in Romans, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed through faith in Jesus Christ. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now we only got one more chance at today's wordle. It's a word that begins with G-R-A and ends in E. And it answers the question that puzzled Luther. It answers the question that puzzles you and me. One five-letter word about the life of faith. Have you solved the puzzle yet? Let's answer the wordle together. G. R A C E. That's it. It was staring us in the face. It was there all along. We just didn't see it until the gospel opened our eyes. Grace is the word that helps us make sense of our world and our relationship with God. Welcome to worship. Welcome to Lord of Life. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Fill it with all truth and peace. Where it is corrupt, purify it. Where it is in error, direct it. Where in anything it is amiss, reform it. Where it is right, strengthen it. Where it is in need, provide for it. Where it is divided, reunite it. 
For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The gospel for this Reformation weekend is found in John chapter 8, beginning at the 31st verse. Glory to you, O Lord. Then Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So, if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. (coughs) My mother used to tell people that I'd make a wonderful lawyer. Uh, Well, mostly because I like to argue, but also because I like to get the last word. The last word was the important word. If you took debate when I did, or speech class, they called it, getting the last word was important. So when you flipped that coin to see who started, it was more important to see who finished. Getting the last word. Well, for Martin Luther, who we celebrate and remember this weekend, our Reformation weekend, uh, celebrating the 500th uh, plus anniversary of the nailing of the 95 Thesis in that castle church door in Wittenberg, Germany. For Martin Luther, the word was the most important truth, the only truth. We refer to Jesus as the word of God, the living word of God. And for Martin Luther, the word was The word was the message, grace alone, word alone, scripture alone, faith alone. Martin Luther understood how important it was not just to be in the word, but for the people to be in the word themselves, not just the the priests and the leaders of the church. To that end, in 1522, after Martin Luther had been uh, excommunicated by the Catholic Church in the Diet of Worms in 1521, he was um, ensconced in the Wittenberg Castle for 10 months, and during that time he translated the New Testament into vernacular German. It was such a feat to do this. There had been German versions before from the 900s and uh, Middle Ages, but uh, nothing in this vernacular that was used as a um, the the foundation for the German language for hundreds of years after. He put so much time and energy and effort into doing that and knowing that others who had changed uh, the word of God from Latin or the um, Greek or Hebrew had been put to death by the church for daring to, to translate the word of God into another language other than the sanctioned language of the church. So he made his own New New Testament, and in September of 1522, 3,000 editions were printed. 3,000 editions of the German Bible. And by December, they printed up 3,000 more. This is what Luther had to say about his work. In my translation of the Bible, I strove to use pure and intelligible German, 
Our quest for an expression could sometimes last for weeks without us being happy. <laughs> In addition, I have not worked on my own. I recruited assistance from everywhere. I tried to speak in German, not Greek, not Latin, but to speak German, one should turn to the text in Latin, the housewife, children playing, people in the street are those to learn from. Listening to them teaches one how to speak and how to translate. Then they will understand you and you will know to speak your language. How important it was to listen to children. He didn't want this to be over anyone's head, hard to understand, hard to get the concepts. He wanted this to be where people were at home, at home in their faith, at home in the word, the word of God. Jesus is telling us in John's gospel <clears throat> that the truth will set people free. The truth will set people free. That Jesus says, if you continue in my word, if you continue in my word, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. How important is that word? The word that comes straight from God. The word that comes and brings us salvation. The word that comes and brings us forgiveness of sins. The most important word, Jesus himself. We have the word of God and because of a monk like Martin Luther who defied the powers that be, great powers that be, who decided to ask questions. Why should people pay for forgiveness of sin? Where in the word of God does it say we have to pay to get out of a place called purgatory? Where does it say that works will get us into heaven? No, Martin Luther understood the scripture as he read it and taught it and now translated it himself. He understood that the Bible says over and over through the words of Paul in Galatians, we are not justified by the works of the law. We are justified in Christ Jesus by our faith in Christ Jesus. Not in the works, but in the faith of the work of Jesus Christ. It's not what we do. It's what Jesus has already done. It seems so logical for us all these years later. That's all we've heard. That's what we've been taught. That's how we understand our theology and our doctrines in the Lutheran church. But 500 years ago, that was life-changing and life-threatening to suggest that the only authority was from scripture and not from Pope or church traditions or other church writings. No, Martin Luther said, scripture alone, not anything else. If you cannot show me except by scripture, he said, he cannot in good conscience change his mind. Here I stand, I shall do no other. I cannot do any other but to stand on the word of God. So today we celebrate so many things. We celebrate these early Christian believers who, uh, who put forth this word and put it together in our scriptures over a series of centuries, getting our Bible just so. We thank God for them and the Holy Spirit that preserved the writings of someone like Paul uh, over the centuries from the time he wrote them to certain audiences to now to us all these years later that show us this truth that Jesus is saying will set us free, we know it's not what we do, it's what we believe. And it's not just what we believe, it's in whom we believe. We are saved by grace. We are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It is not anything we do so that we may not boast. It is a work of God. Oh, St. Paul knew exactly how to say the truth as it was relayed to him by Jesus. We are saved by grace, not anything we can do. And then we have all these years later, people still interpreting the word, still trying to uh, interpret it, translate it. Every translation is an interpretation. I tell people that in every Bible class I teach, every time I translate something, I'm interpreting it. I have what I see 
in those words, what I hear being said in those words, and I base it and compare it to what Jesus is saying, and if it lines up, for instance, the Lutheran Church still is changing and reforming, and now for over 50 years we've had women ministers, but that was quite a shocking change back in the day. Not everyone was excited about that, and the big reason was they were changing the word of God. St. Paul, if we're going to listen to him when he writes about uh, we're saved by grace through faith, shouldn't we also listen to him when he says women should keep quiet in the church? Except what is he really saying in 1 Corinthians 14, verses 34 through 36, that women should keep quiet in the church? It's all a matter of translation and interpretation. And here's what I was taught. St. Paul was writing a letter, the letter to the Corinthians, the first one. And he was answering questions as someone does when they write a letter. And you probably remember this from school. In your answer, you wrote part of the question. Otherwise, your answer may not make sense to the person who then receives your answer, unless you put the question in it. Paul was answering questions. He was writing a letter back to the people in Corinth who were struggling with certain dissension in their group, trying to figure out what teaching is real, what teaching is important, what teaching uh, is false, uh, to stay true to the word as Paul had given it to them and others had given it to them. And so here comes this, this sentence, women should keep quiet in the church. And then there's a word, what? With a question mark. What? Does the word of God, does the spirit of God originate only in you? Does the spirit of God originate only in you? Hmm. You, masculine, plural. The way I have interpreted that, it translated that, is that Paul is quoting from the letter he had received about a statement that women should just keep quiet in church. And his response to that statement was a question. What? Does the Spirit of God only reside in you? In other words, he's not telling people, he's not telling women that they have to keep quiet in church. He's putting the record straight for the people in Corinth who think that is the case. Now, a lot of you will hopefully look up in your Bibles, 1 Corinthians 14, 34 through 36, and a lot of your versions today won't have the what. The what's been translated and interpreted out. But it's there in the Greek. What? Does the Holy Spirit reside only in you? Thank goodness for people who, like Martin Luther, took weeks weeks of comparing and contrasting and knowing the importance of every word that he would draw from to illuminate the gospel for the people reading it now in their own language. Thank goodness there are still people who take the time to go back as far as we can to original, original texts, original translations, original as close as we can come and call original, because we don't have the very original, but we have so much that has been built on the originals. And we can go back and we can look and we can pray and we can hear again Jesus saying, stay in my word. If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciple and the truth will set you free. All these women for centuries who wanted to be the bearer of the good news of Jesus Christ and told no because Paul said they couldn't speak in church. And then the Enlightenment coming in the 60s and 70s in the Lutheran Church in America. What? Does the Holy Spirit reside only in you? No. The Spirit of God is for all, setting all free. So the sisters that have gone before me and the sisters who are walking with me and preaching with me and the sisters that will be coming after me. Uh, we owe a lot 
to Martin Luther and all the reformers who dared, who dared to take the time to look at the truth of the word. And it's still in our tradition today to look for the truth in the word. That truth will set us free. And just like my mother said, I'm having the last word. Amen. proclaim our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our response to the prayers of intercession is your mercy is great. In gratitude and humility, let us join together in prayer on behalf of all of God's creation. God, our fortress, we pray for the church. Write your law of love on the hearts of your people, that we remain steadfast in our witness to your grace. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God, our liberator, We pray for your earth. Bring new life to overused land and contaminated rivers. Reform and reorient our relationship with the environment that we faithfully care for all your creation. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God, our refuge and strength, we pray for the nations. Where they are in uproar, bring wise leadership and comfort for those in distress. Make wars to cease and peace to enter every land. 
Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God, our very present help in trouble, we pray for those in need. Show mercy to refugees and all fleeing from danger. Shelter any without homes. Calm all who are facing illness, surgery, or a new diagnosis. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God, our Redeemer, we pray for our congregation. Bless all who are preparing for baptism or affirmation of baptism. Open their hearts to your Holy Spirit. Teach them your word and give them courage to proclaim their faith. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. God, our stronghold, we pray this day for the community and the congregation of Shepherd of the Desert Lutheran Church in Sun City. Strengthen their laity, enliven their ministries, and embrace their faith that it may grow stronger for service to you and to share the gospel with the world. Strengthen their pastor, John Maroney, in his work in your church. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. God, our passion, we give thanks for those who have gone before us in faith, especially Martin Luther and all reformers. Renew and reform us as we strive to continue in your word. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. With grateful hearts, we commend our spoken and silent prayers to you, O oh God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray the prayer that our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Receive the benediction. The God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another, in accordance with Christ Jesus. The God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the God of all grace bless you now and forever. Amen.